So if you expect to want to uh, fire one of these things up and not just leave it on the uh, shelf for the next 20 years, you're going to have to face the fact that you're going to need a power supply. Now there are some ham power supplies that could be adapted. The old Heathkit HP23 could probably be adapted. Of course the voltage on the HP23 is too high, so instead of using a full wave doubler circuit as Heathkit did, you could convert it to a full wave bridge and that would have the voltage and double the current, so that would be ideal for the command set. So that's one way to go, modify something. The other uh, thing you could do is look for a transformer. Look for a transformer on eBay or at a flea market that would provide 5 to 600 volts center tapped at uh, at least two or 300 milliamps. Um, and I think that would be the basis for a good power supply. The 24 volts is not as big big of a problem nowadays since there are so many well-regulated 24 volt power supplies around. A lot of these small switchers that are 24 volts at 2 amps are ideal for powering the filaments and relays in the ARC-5. So let's discuss the uh, connections on the back connector. Starting with uh, pin 1 on the rear connector which is our, uh, our only connection to the transmitter other than the antenna and ground. Pin 1 is the ground connection. Pin 2 is the grid monitor and we can read the uh, current uh, that's uh, being put into the final amplifiers grid the drive power into the final amplifiers from the oscillator. Pin 3 is the oscillator voltage. Pin 4 is the screen grid voltage. Those are separated because uh, we might be modulating this transmitter so we have to uh, put modulation into, the, into pin 4 the screen grid but not into the oscillator. Pin 5 is the key line, that's where we'd hook up a Morse code key. And pin 6 is the filament line where we put uh, plus 24 volts DC. Finally, pin 7 in the middle is our uh, B plus for the plate. Uh, that uh, can be anything from 500 to 650 volts. Okay, we've added a couple of uh, interesting items here to the, to the mix. These are power supplies. This is uh, an appropriate power supply for a command set ARC-5 transmitter. And here's another one, a little more modern. One thing that you need uh, when you're powering up the transmitter are three voltages. You need uh, 24 to 28 volts DC at uh, about one ampere to light the filaments and to run the relays. And you need uh, approximately 200 volts on the oscillators. It's found that uh, voltages between 190 and about 220 volts DC on the VFO, the ARC-5, provides the, uh, the best keying characteristics, uh, the least drift. You can run the oscillator higher, up to 100, uh, uh, 250 volts DC, but uh, you will not get uh, the excellent uh, drift and keying that you get at the lower voltage. So 200, 210, 220 volts is just about ideal on that VFO. The screen grid of the 1625s is a separate input on the back of the uh, transmitter. You can run that at the same voltage. You can run it at the regulated 220 volts, or you can run it at a little higher voltage, uh, unregulated. Uh, some people run it as high as 300 volts DC. And then the high voltage uh, can be anything from really 400 volts up to about 650 volts DC, depending on how much power you want to run with the transmitter. You'll notice uh, the more modern supply doesn't have the, uh, the filter choke. Um, that's because it actually has electronic regulation rather than using a, uh, a pie type filter. I'm going to go through four different power supply designs. One supply design uh, coming out of the, uh, the CQ command sets manual, which uh, was published uh, in the 50s. Uh, the second one is uh, coming out of the ARRL handbook. Uh, made for the novice use of the transmitter. And in the novice use, they actually used a crystal uh, adapter with the transmitter. So keying wasn't as much of an item, uh, an issue when you were uh, when you had a crystal controlled uh, transmitter. Keying the final worked out very well, and there was no chirp. However, when people tried to use that handbook power supply 
with the transmitter, with the VFO control, there was a significant amount of chirp. And that's why you really need to work on the regulation on the VFO. Uh, the the uh, third uh, power supply that I'm going to show you is a power supply that uh, I developed uh, a few years ago and I've used on the transmitters fairly successfully. And the uh, fourth power supply, I've actually uh, taken advantage of some modern components such as the switching power supply that we use uh, on all kinds of uh, electronic devices. And uh, you'll find a lot of these 24 volt switching power supplies. Uh, they're very small and uh, they're uh, providing uh, 2 amps at 24 volts, 3 amps at 24 volts. Those make ideal power supplies uh, for the filaments. And I regulate the uh, 200 volts with uh, Zeners and MOSFET high voltage uh, uh, devices. You can also use uh, voltage regulator tubes, although the voltage regulator tube is uh, not enough capacity to uh, regulate the VFO and the screen grid you could certainly regulate both of those separately with separate banks of VR tubes such as uh, a pair of VR 105s in series. Uh, you might use uh, a VR 150 and a VR 105 for the screen grid of the 1625s and a pair of VR 105s for the oscillator. But it starts to get ridiculous when you have that many voltage regulator tubes on a power supply. That's why I opted to go solid state with my regulation. Point. Um, in the old days, they used to use uh, high voltage regulate rectifier tubes such as the 5U4 and the 5V4 to power the ARC 5s. Uh, today, we have modern diodes, um, the modern diodes in the 1 amp or the uh, 3 amp or 5 amp range uh, at 1,000 volts. Uh, perhaps two of those in each leg of a bridge uh, would uh, provide a very nice uh, rectifier system and it would have much better regulation than the vacuum tube uh, rectifier. So today we use diodes instead of uh, vacuum tube rectifiers. And uh, not having as uh, readily supply of uh, television parts, people scavenge the internet, eBay, to find transformers that are appropriate. The other advantage we have today is high value capacitors. Uh, instead of using 4 and 8 microfarad capacitors at 450 volts, we can get our hands on 150 or 200 microfarad capacitors at 3 or 400 volts and we can stack them up and by using equalizing resistors we're able to make a, a significantly larger capacitance. This also improves the filtering and the regulation compared to the old days when they had to use the smaller oil filled and uh, older electrolytic. So here is a, a 5U4 rectifier tube uh, in the center tap transformer circuit, this is what was typically used in uh, the handbook circuit. Uh, uh, shows uh, this tube being used as well as the CQ conversion manual. Today we use solid state diodes such as this uh, 1N5804. Um, these diodes handle uh, the same amount of current at much lower voltage drop. Uh, they have uh, excellent uh, performance. And uh, with eight of these, you can make a bridge that would work very nicely at a 600 volt level uh, for the transmitter. Both 1N4007 and 1N5804 diodes are excellent choices for high voltage uh, systems. Uh, you do, uh, with the older diodes, normally need to use uh, equalizing resistors and capacitors when you're making banks, uh, high voltage bridges up. Uh, with these newer diodes, however, the uh, leakage is so low on them that generally you can stack them in series without having to use capacitors and resistors. Uh, it would take about eight of these to make a, a very nice bridge uh, for the five or six hundred volt uh, power supply that we need to make for this transmitter. Notice that this power supply has been outfitted with an IEC filtered inlet like you have on the back of your PC. This uh, allows uh, some added filtering uh, if you should put, use a, uh, a switching power supply such as the 20, 24 volt uh, 2 amp 
switching power supply, you enclose that completely in the metal box. And with this added filtering, uh, any noise that switcher might make isn't going to come out and bother your receiver. Here's a typical uh, uh, cable assembly. Plugs into the back, and the other end is going to go into the back of the transmitter. Of course, adding metering is nice. Uh, knowing that your uh, plate current is, for instance, uh, 180 milliamps, which is the ideal current for a pair of 1625s at about 600 volts, is a nice feature to have on the front of your power supply. Uh, this is also a good place to mount a key jack, uh, an on-off switch, and a transmit-receive switch. The transmit-receive switch should be a, uh, a double-pole type uh, with a set of dry contacts that can be used to switch uh, something like a Dow key antenna relay or some other antenna switching system. And this makes a practical way to use the transmitter on the air with an existing station receiver. Now up to this point we haven't brought up the the idea of interference or uh, television interference, uh, stereo interference and so on. But these transmitters of course built, uh, designed in the late 30s, early uh, 40s. They were not designed to uh, be completely clean in regard to uh, some harmonics and parasitics. Uh, so uh, if you want to operate the transmitter on the air, it would be a good idea to run it through an antenna tuner or a low-pass filter, common low-pass ham filters that can handle uh, a couple hundred watts at work just fine. Now you want to you want to hook up to the antenna with this antenna post Rather than putting an SO239 on here, uh, like was done uh, many times, um, there's a small screw underneath, and you can put a lug off that screw and uh, attach some coax directly to those two points and run that off to your Dow key relay and your filter system. So there's no need to modify the transmitter. You can use it as is, as long as you get a good ground to the chassis on the shield of the coax and run the coax hot right to the uh, center post of the antenna terminal. The other thing is on the back, um, just on the inside of the transmitter, uh, for added uh, RF uh, protection, uh, a lot of people like to solder 0.005 or 0.01 microfarad disk capacitors to every single contact on that connector to ground on the inside. And that provides a lot of RF protection for the transmitter. That will keep most of the harmonics inside the transmitter where they belong. So finally, how do we connect this power supply to the rear of the transmitter? As you can see on the back of the transmitter, we have this seven pin socket type plug. You're gonna find this on, on all of the, uh, the transmitters. This is actually made to blind mate into a shock mount assembly. If you can find either a single transmitter shock mount assembly or a triple mount, where three transmitters can be racked in. That would be the ideal way to supply power. Most of the hams uh, didn't have the wherewithal to, to get the, the rack mounts, so they actually soldered. They'd put wires right into those connectors and solder right to the terminals. Or they would replace the connector with an octal type socket. You can, in fact, manufacture your own plug to go into these and uh, by taking apart some of those old phenolic type connectors I was able to fashion my own homemade connector system for the transmitters and I've built several of them over the years. So here's uh, a typical phenolic or cinch connector that I would break up and I would use pins off a connector like this to, to to form the, uh, the homemade connector uh, for the back of the brig. So it's been, uh, it's been quite a, a trip to get to this point. Um, I think everybody's anxious to uh, hear what uh, these transmitters sound like on the air. So in the next video we're finally going to get to hook this thing up to a power supply and an antenna and uh, see what it sounds like, see what the note sounds like, see how much power we can get out and make a few contacts on the air.